So, uh, Martin, if I start with you, just on the, well, it's you both, but Martin, I'll direct this to you first, just on kind of the genesis of this one, because it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a horror film for people that love horror. There's also some comedy in there. It's a mix of all these these things and about the kind of, I don't know, the the, the scary nature of being a stand-up comic, I guess, <laughs> in heckles and everything. But how did how did this kind of start? What was the kind of the first, what was the catalyst for you wanting to make this film? Um, how I got involved was that with Anthony wrote this script for a short called Blue Moon, um, which is about a werewolf attack on a dogging site. Yeah. Uh, we made it. And that sounds uh, amazing. May I just jump in? That sounds amazing. Why have we not? Why would? Why have we not got this in our lives? <laughs> I'm going to send you a link to that. I'm going to give you a succinct praise of it. And we made that with uh, uh, a friend of ours, colleague Louis Selwyn, out in um, out in East Anglia, and it uh, it turned out well, and it got him to Screamfest LA, you know, a big horror festival out in the US, and we went out to see the premiere at uh, Grandma's Chinese Theatre. And in, on our trip, we were discussing, oh, we've done this short now, it's turned out well, what should we do next? How can we move on? And we didn't want to do something, we don't want to get, I mean, I, I work in animation, um, animation director, right? We, we didn't want to do something that would be prohibitive and slow down the process. We get bogged down with like expensive CGI monsters. So Anthony had the script he developed already which was all about character, you know, with a bit of stabbing in it, but mainly character playing mm. off each other. And um, it was great, you know, we thought if we got the casting right and got good people in it, it would, in theory, be quite easy to shoot and make, you know? Yeah. Yeah, in theory. In theory. <laughs> what, was it, what was it like in uh, practice, Anthony? Was it, it a bit more? It was quite, I mean, it's difficult because uh, we did it in segments, we did it in four blocks, but it, it was great in that the performers came together very well and Martin ran a really tight ship. But, you know, indie filmmaking is very, very hard always. So, it, and this one had a lot of locations, which was great because we did want to go that bit further. But it's never easy, but it, it is the best thing you can do. Yeah, and it's, I mean, in terms of in terms of the way you made the movie, you talked there about how how you went about it and did it before segments and stuff. Are you do you enjoy? I mean, obviously you have made it for a, for a low budget. Does that give because it, it gives the film kind of a, a unique energy? Whereas when you watch, I guess, a horror film that's been made by a studio or anything else, there's yeah. there's more money, there's more time, and all, all these things. But actually, some of these horror films they have they have their unique energy because of the way you you make it. Do you do you, do you feel that that helps the film in, in some respect? Yeah. I, I think you have to look, look at things like that, you know, because I, I do stuff that's um, a lot more commercial and animation and stuff. And I think the thing about doing this kind of work is that it's a quick blast. You know, you're, you're shooting quickly, you're shooting scene after scene after scene, and you're, you're shooting in a very live way, and you don't have like loads of execs breathing down your neck or anything like that. Mm. Yeah, that must, that must that must be a, you know that must be a everyone everyone has their yeah everyone has their opinion don't they when you when you get I think, other I think it's, involved. You know, I think it's a, yeah the, the release sense of it is a great thing and, and <laughs> in the past you know we were talking about Steve Gutenberg the other day you know just letting him riff and ad lib you know there's no exec there going but we signed off this script we just let him run and, and go mad with with stuff and the other thing is also and somebody said recently that when people pick out their favorite horror films, they go straight to the independent ones. So it's mm. The Evil Dead, Blair Witch, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's the only genre really where these lower budget films rule the kingdom. And that's because there's so much heart and, you know, heart of darkness to them. Uh, it's very rare that, yeah. Yeah. In terms of your writing process, Anthony, how long did this one take you to, to write? Did you have this idea for a while or, or was it something that you kind of- Yeah, this, this one. Yeah, I really did. I mean, the, the the original idea was kind of knocking about in two thousand six, and then it wasn't. It wasn't really. Uh, there were other things, other projects, and then I I came back to it once we'd done the Blue Moon project and realised well, we could, with Martin here with this, make this something really special, and rewrote it and kind of got it to where it should have been, as I'd learned a bit more about the craft. And yeah, it took a while, but then it's very fast. You're just kind of locked in a room for you know, a few weeks once you've done a lot of treatment work and you just kind of nail all that, all that crazy energy that then translates hopefully onto the screen. I think if you've seen the film, you'll, you'll see it is that kind of tsunami of madness that builds. And that's what we were going for. 
That is a, a good way to describe it, a tsunami of madness. I like that. Yeah. That's good. That's what it should be on your poster. Well, you said it, <laughs> so we'll take that quote from you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, they, all, they all go off for a mad party in the country and, and, and weird things happen. And that was also <laughs> our experience of our production, you know. Yeah. Yeah, how how happy are you about the the fact that it's in Fright Fest? Because this is this is the this is the audience, isn't it? This is Delighted. the audience that's. Delighted. It's it's where it's where it should be. It's where we would have aimed it to be. Yeah. yeah. The best audience in the world. Martin and I are big fans of Fright Fest, and actually had that festival in mind. I think for both our projects, really, we knew it's the right audience. Yeah, I guess it's a shame as well that it's it's how it is. But I guess you must be delighted that people are seeing it anyway, because people are still almost renting the film because they're buying a ticket still than, than not obviously not being able to go to a cinema at the moment. Yeah, you still get the exposure and uh, it's just the world at the moment, isn't it? And, but yeah, everyone's going to enjoy, I hope, watching. I, I mean, I'm at Fright Fest now, so we've got movies beginning tonight at six. I'm super excited. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of good stuff. Uh, before I ask you about your, your Hollywood actor, I wanted to ask you about Guy because he's, he's fantastic in the movie. I just wondered... Where, what was it about him, maybe Martin, for you first, what was it about him as an actor that made him perfect to play Joe? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a role that's, you know, he's a stand-up comic, but then, as you say, he gets involved in this, as you said, tsunami of madness. So it, it, there's lots of different layers to, to the character. Uh, because I come from sort of visual side of things, sort of animation, you know, you, you think of things very visual storytelling. We met him, he was been recommended uh, as a stand-up. I mean, you saw him with this kind of... George Harrison meets Charles Manson kind of look and his kind of 70s outfit and everything. And I thought he looks like a rogue modern hipster comic, you know, in the Russell Brand, Noel Fielding kind of thing. You know, this guy looks apart. And then you found out that he could act as well. And there's a big thing. We had, a, we had this massive casting session where we rented a theatre in South London and we auditioned like 60 people in one day for this film coming. Out. And... Um, guy who we already had him slated for the lead role but he had to play the foil to all these other actors coming in that day and he sustained it throughout the day and did all the different shifts of uh, emotion and played all the different scenes properly so he thought you know he's pretty good yeah yeah and uh, Anthony what was your reaction when you when you saw that guy was going to be playing the character because it, as I say he has such a great energy in the film that it adds to everything that you're trying to to trying to do with the, with the story yeah, Guy is, <clears throat> Guy is larger than life, um, the way he comes across. And we were looking at Russell Brand, and obviously with, uh, we'll talk about Steve later, a very different type of comedian, more end of the pier. And with Guy, it was that Russell Brand kind of uh, peacocking <laughs> fop almost. And uh, I think he really nails that kind of uh, edgy, slightly neurotic sensibility that a lot of comedians have, actually, I think. Uh, they have a, a side to them that they kind of need to be on stage or they'd be maybe in jail. I don't, <laughs> Frankie Boyle, I don't know what else he'd have done. He'd be in a lot of trouble, maybe. <laughs> yeah, not everyone can go on to host the Great British Bake Off, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Noel does so superbly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, I'm glad you said that because he did remind me of Noel because I've obviously been watching a lot of Bake Off recently because I've been watching the older series and he's just been in my head for a while. So when I watched this, I was like... He, it's like no fielding. It's it's incredible. Yeah, um, I mean, I looked at um, looked at guy and thought, you know, however the film does, you can almost reduce his face to an emoji. You know, it's like a simple, <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially with the beard and stuff. It's like yeah. it'd be a very distinctive emoji. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, the rest of your cast. I mean, how how quickly did you get those together? Aside from Steve, because I'll ask you about him separately, but. Obviously, you've got Madison in there, you've got, you've got Clark, you've got uh, Danny Dyer, you know, all these other people. I mean, did you, was, this, was this part of the whole process that you auditioned lots of different people until you settled on who you thought might be right? We did the, the first casting, first read through we did about a year before we started shooting. And the two people who stayed in it from that reading were Danny Dyer, because of uh, comic timing, just, just brilliant, you know, just funny. <laughs> Immediately, it's, you know, it's just great, it's, you know, pure pure English comedy. And uh, we had Louis Selwyn, who we shifted around in a role. We'd use him on Blue Moon, but we got him to play the David character. He was really good. And then, the, the, and then we did this massive casting session, which was exhausting. And then after that, we picked some real gems. We got uh, Madison, who's really cool. Uh, you know, he's sharp, very cool cucumber. And then Steph, Stephanie as well, who plays Catherine. She was really cool. Yeah, yeah they all, they're all and together, then, all have a fantastic energy together, which is, which is great. 
I mean, that's Very the thing. There's not, there's not loads of, you know, you, you don't have loads of special effects and stuff. So you've got basically a bunch of people in a room. So you've got to make them like strong characters that contrast with each other and play off each other. Yeah, that's a great, a, a fantastic energy. I mean, Ant Anthony, when when you cut when you wrote those characters, I mean, did you did you? Uh, I hesitate to say you 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 wrote it specifically for people because I presume you didn't write it that way. Yeah. But did you did you? Was it a great feeling when you saw them acting and auditioning and stuff? They came the to life. Yeah, that's always the best thing ever. So, I mean, Nicholas Vince, I wrote <laughs> the the guy in the sauna with Nicholas Vince in mind because I just thought it'd be a fun cameo. Um, but yeah, when it when when you get somebody like Madison Clare, I really loved Madison as the leading lady. I just thought she was. Um, re I don't want to you know say too much. I mean, I think that she's uh, she goes on her journey uh, in that film with such um, a naturalism that it, it just sets the thing on fire. And I really like all you know everybody involved. Um, there's a lot of different types of style, and it comes together really well. It's kind of like a a Dickensian thing, the, the kind of eccentric showbiz types push slightly um, to give it that, that, that. Yeah, every type and, and, and also, uh, I keep on saying, I just like, I like movies that you can endlessly rewatch because you, you think, oh, we're going to get to that scene now where that, that character comes in, he's so quirky, like Renfield and the old Dracula or something like that. And in our movie, we have, uh, you know, Nick Vince and, um, Toya, you know, they, they come along the timeline and bring different energies as the movie progresses, which is nice. Yeah. In terms of your shooting, then how 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 many days did you shoot? Was it a quick a quick a quick shoot? Uh, well, what the, the the real problem was is that we started off with an idea. Literally, we're going to get these characters and get them in a in a small house in a room and just film them all with like a roving camera, you know, like film someone's mobile phone almost, or you know, like a black magic simple very like, like coherence or something like that but uh, i made the terrible mistake of employing that really good crew who lit it really beautifully which um slowed it down and um added production value but we we started to slow down so we had a first block and we yeah then we had to reconvene and get everyone back in there again so i guess it's about i don't know a month shooting maybe anthony i don't know all in all. Yeah, or I, I lose I lose track actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was there was some you know, there were some children in it. Ray Kelly's ki kids with, with no spoilers, but there was a concern that when they came back, that they might have gone through puberty and developed it all different. Well, they're ways. all fifty, aren't they now? Those kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, such is, such is lockdown that they've aged ridiculously yeah. quickly. <laughs> um, well, I, I will ask you now about about Steve Gutenberg because when I. When I saw the lineup for Fight Fest, immediately as soon as I saw his name, I thought, "What is this? What is this with with, with Steve Gutenberg?" So I guess it's it's a good tool, I guess, for you guys in terms of it's it's a it's a name that people recognise and everything else. But what what interested you about having him in this particular role, and and how did you go about kind of getting him in the first place? How did you kind of get in the idea, get in the idea, get in the script, and then did it take some convincing to for him to say yes? You know, this was the, because because the production value had gone up by mistake, and. Um, we started to shoot it well and we got good performances. So the thing started to snowball and we got other people. And then like, you know, the second block, we got Toya in and, uh, you know, Nick Vince and it started to look good and, and, and amass a kind of momentum. So by the stage where we had to shoot his, his scenes, which was like, like a final key missing piece, we had, everything was looking pretty cool. So I think casting agents could approach him with something that did seem like a solid yeah. proposition. You know. I know, yeah, and I know you wanted to go dark. I think he had a lot of fun, you know, in Cocoon and Short Circuit and Three Men and a Baby. He's a very nice guy. And in this movie, he's not. He's really not a very nice guy. And I think he, he was just enjoying coming over to England, being in the grey, rainy weather and being a bit of a dick. <laughs> he kind of enjoyed that <laughs> process. To some yeah, point. yeah. And it seemed, it seemed to me watching it as well in that there's a lot of, a fa a bit, obviously he, he you know i've seen him in many movies he was part of my childhood watching as you say short circuit and three men and a baby and all that kind of stuff but there's a there's a kind of 
there's a lure to watching people that you know being funny and being nice when they turn dark, you know, obviously. Mm. Robin, Robin Williams in One Hour Photo or Insomnia yes, yeah. or people doing that kind of stuff. Um, but they seem to have a certain, their comic timing lends itself to that. Did you find that with him, that it, that it, it lent itself? He was quite an easy fit, if you like. Yeah, I mean, comedians are often really good actors. Mm. Um, uh, and he, he has that sort of range. And he had spent a lot of time, he'd, re, he'd, he'd hung out with lots of guys who were like this, which was the kind of character we were after. He was like someone who, for the past, who was like Mr. Family Entertainment, you know, uh, Saturday Night TV, a vunkier, you know, your lo lovable uncle, light entertainment guy, who is great on screen, but when you meet him, not so nice and very territorial, like now this is my space and I'm going to behave very differently to you. And, and he did enjoy that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Anthony, when you wrote it, did you, yeah, when you wrote it, uh, when you wrote Ray as a character, I mean, did you, did you, did you perceive anybody in your head? Obviously this was, I guess this was out of the blue, but did you perceive someone specifically to take on that? Yeah, role? definitely. Yeah. I'd heard that Jim Davidson was really nasty backstage <laughs> at the Wimbledon Theatre. Uh, I, I don't know if that's true and I don't want to say anything against, but, but it, it's a thing where uh, I'd been going to the comedy store and I saw an edge to some comedians. They're so good when they come out. It's so gladiatorial that they take on the audience almost as if in a fight. And after the interval, when people have had a drink, it's literally like gladiator. And I find that really interesting. So they've got to be tough guys to kind of survive that. And then when you see Steve taking that on, he really does bring that that into it so yeah comedians that edge that they carry was definitely in there and he found a lot there yeah no and we gave him the space to do it and um go right off the page and ad lib uh and really run with it and then once once that was played out and we had that structure we, we just worked out the rest of the day around that you know with all the blocking and the crew and everything mm. I don't think I've ever hear, heard him swear before, particularly swear like this. It's like, I don't, oh, I don't remember oh, that in Police Academy. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it compensates for that quite well. Yeah, compensates for not being able to swear at uh, the little girl and three men and a little lady or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah short circuit or something. <laughs> Makes up for it. <laughs> yeah, he worked out our rating pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. our rating. Right. Good. I'm not, yeah. I'm not bound by the constraints of... Hollywood studio comedies. <laughs> uh, so in terms of in terms of the festival, then as I say, it's 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 the it's kind of the audience that you that you that you that you would want to see the movie for the first time or the second time or everything else because there's a great energy. How are you feeling about people watching it at home? Because it's obviously very very different, but mm. almost you'd get the same reactions in the sense that given social media and stuff, that your reactions would be pretty instantaneous. You know, people can talk about it with their friends pretty pretty quickly are you are you happy that there there hopefully will be you know a, an immediate buzz and talk about the, the film yeah i mean uh it, it it's the new reality we have we have to sort of just sort of accept it but uh, i think i think it it does it will work like that yeah because it's at an allotted time and it is a very genre audience so yeah yeah, I think people will enjoy this one. Anthony, are you excited for people to, to see it as of well? Of course I am. I mean, I miss the cinema like everybody does. And the thing is that with the Fright Fest Halloween event being on the IMAX screen, of course you want to see those giant pumpkin faces up there and all that 80s madness with VHS players, etc. But this is the new reality. And, and the story, hopefully, is the thing that always carries through. And the visuals are great, and I think people are going to enjoy that on a, any screen. Hopefully not a small... This is not good. We like the bigger TVs and things, yeah. Yeah, particularly the, the look. Yeah, the we had a lot look of your the music right. on it. Yeah. Sorry, the, mu oh. the music, the sort music, of '80s music, and that, that sort of. We had this Rusty Egan came as music supervisor and, and did got these kind of great kind of retro chic '80s music synth tracks for the party, and uh, uh, we got these cool composers, Savage and Spies, who did the Human Centipede originally, came in oh, and wow. did the rest of the tour. And uh, this guy Will Gold, who did the sound design, so sort of thickening all that that up to to make you know to add to the madness was great. That's that's a film you probably want to watch at home, right? You wouldn't want to watch that with the Fright Fest crowd, The Human Centipede. That's that would be a, <laughs> <laughs> would be a mad a mad experience. <laughs> uh, yeah. And just for you, just for you both, I mean, Anthony, starting with you, what 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 what's next for you? You know, I I've, I'm 
my interest is peaked at your werewolf dogging film. So, so what's next for, for you? We're doing, uh, Martin and I are doing a project, but we're not allowed to talk too much about that yet. So I'll talk about uh, a film called Advent that we might be doing, which is about a cursed advent calendar. And it's a supernatural horror film and a high concept, uh, scary, hopefully, film. Um, yeah, so fingers crossed that's moving into production soon. It's very hard with COVID, but mm. you can film if people are tested and uh, you do it in bubbles and things, which we've done recently. So, yeah, hoping to bring Advent to, to life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got yeah we've got projects going, other horror things. Obviously, we want to continue and develop and, and build what we've done so far. I am... I'm actually di directing a kid show for Netflix, kid CGI show. Oh wow! <laughs> and um, uh, I do one thing. I did one thing. I did thing. I did recently, which I th I really enjoyed or was really proud of. With animation sequences on this movie, Coup Fifty Three, uh, which is about CIA MI six intervening in Iran in the fifties and destabilizing it for the oil, and. Um, it was made by director Taki Am Amirani and cut by Walter Murch, who cut Apocalypse Now. And uh, it opened to, you know, did really well in August, opened then. So I, I do these other things. But yeah, building on this narrative stuff, you know, yeah. hopefully in the future, bring, bring my animation into the sort of dark horror genre as well. And, you know, find the point where the, it all fuses and gels. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, we're going to uh, team up, just quickly, we're going to team up with Steve Gutenberg again, Martin and I and Steve, we will do something in england with him we're trying to make that happen that should be a lot of fun Allow him off. Story. are you are you the guys that are making three men and a bride or <laughs> circuit three or police academy reboot? three men and a, and a ghost that one. three men really? and a ghost that it, hey there is the legend of the ghost on three men and a baby isn't there of the uh, yeah i love that legend, but yeah Great. scary I story <laughs> unfortunate reality it just being a cardboard cut out of ted dancing but yeah. I like to think it, it was a, a kid with a shotgun. Scary. Yeah. It's the, I think it was when you've watched it for the first time on the VHS, that's what everyone was kind of like, what? That's yeah, ghost, surely. And you see HD, <laughs> you're like, well, it's clearly Ted Danson. <laughs> <You know. laughs> oh, good. Well, hopefully the, your next film will be, people will be able to see, you know, at Fright Fest, you get to do the whole, yes. the whole proper shebang. So fingers crossed. Uh, guys, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely pleasure chatting to you. Uh, yeah. Good luck with the film and everything. And uh, yeah, maybe speak to you again soon for your next film. Yeah. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time.